Hi everyone, your chess puzzler here and welcome to the channel. And many wonder who is or was the absolute best player of all time. If only this question could be answered. In the past, many of us wanted to see how Garry Kasparov would fare against the players of the next generation. Garry Tonnet, the next generation of players emerged and the many times, well, former world champion never really got to play any of these players. Now, this was until 2016 when Kasparov made a surprising appearance in the Ultimate Blitz Challenge. Though away from competitive chess, as soon as the arrangements were made, and Kasparov would meet America's best, and by this I'm talking about Fabi, Naka and Wesley, he began to practice. Now, Nikos Sparov wanted to play against this trio, but all three, Fabi, Wesley and Naka, couldn't wait to battle it out against the Formula champ. Something that needs to be said is that all the money Kasparov would earn in this particular event, it would all be donated. Kasparov knew what he was up to. He avoided many modern lines, and what he did nearly in all his games was to adopt the old-fashioned approach. He exclusively avoided certain lines in the Spanish. Okay, with this in mind, let us check out this blitz game between Wesley and the legendary Gary Kasparov. Wesley kicked things off with a routine. Gary responds with g6, e4, bishop g7, d4, d6, c4, and here Gary applies his pin. If I'm not wrong, isn't this the Rosolimo? It is. It's exactly the same opening as the Robach, but is it a bit strange to see it in this specific game? Wesley covered for this pin in this way. Gary introduces the knight. And if it's not d5, Wesley went for something else. This is what he does. It's a solid move. But can anyone remember or knows this Rosalimo variation? With Gary launching this guy, only now Wesley charges after the knight. How you choose to play it, this 9c6 has to move out, if not now, in the next move for sure. With Gary positioning to safety, Wesley gets his king to safety. Gary brings out his other knights. And if you think Gary's rusty, well, think again. There's absolutely nothing rusty about Gary Kasparov. What follows next is interesting. Wesley uses his structure to push on with this guy. He's basically offering a pawn. Can you afford to grab this guy on c5? And if so, why? There is a small trick involved here. An entrapment, if you like. If you take the central pawn, can also be eliminated. If the bishops go home, Kasparov can castle and the game will continue. I can continue it, of course, but let's leave this question unanswered for now. But Gary was not interested in this pawn on c5. What he did was to castle. Wesley trades here and it's whoever gets to occupy key fields and squares. Right now, much of the weight rests on these central pawns but no one appears to have any superiority. This on G7 is completely locked in, and though he looks offside, there is nothing offside about him. This bishop on C1 is by no means having any better. The knight on D7 is also not doing much, but maybe it's early days to look at key outposts. We're still in this moment in time, charged after the bishop. And again, one of them questions, do you trade 
Will you preserve the bishop? Kasparov backed him off. In order to make some progress, Wesley has to move the knight out of the second, but he needs to wait. He can try bishop d3. He then might be looking at queen b3, but chess is not as easy as it sometimes looks. How many does it take to tango? Exactly. Instead of moving two minor pieces to only be able to cover this very important pawn on e4, this is how Wesley plays it. b5, a key important move. Bishop back to the first, and now knight c8. And this is chess at his very best. Kasparov is looking to reposition the knight into b6 and will use the pawn on b5 to support everything. b3, there is a reason for this. And, you know, not surprisingly knight b6, but this rook move. a4, Kasparov does not engage, but goes for this. And with Wesley trading, Wesley comes in with this attack. It's a bluff. If you attack the bishop, if you back him off here, this bishop will be as bad as the counter bishop on g7, or even more useless. But strange enough, we didn't see this. No b4, but Kasparov backs off the knight to be able to both defend and protect these eggs. But is this all true? There is a knight already on c8 covering, but if you need to get this knight to become that more active, this guy on d6 needs to be covered. But knight e8 is already a problem, with Wesley getting his bishop into this outpost. Not only the rook on a1 fully controls his first file, but can Wesley get a strong attack going? When this move materialized, only now we get to understand why Kasparov deemed it essential to back off the knight to the last. It's the best resource to try and demolish Wesley's control of the center. And this is if we assume Wesley has control. What did Wesley do? This was it. A rook lift. But why? Can anyone see something here? One idea is to try bishop a5 to hunt after the queen. But this is obviously not the reason. You can still attack the queen, even without a rook lift. So what is the rook doing on the sixth? Gary came up with a response you don't get to see often. When you play the king's Indian, this bishop on g7 is here for a reason. Kasparov surprisingly gets him to position to the very rim, with the centre just about to break wide open. Wesley eliminated this guy, with Kasparov using the bishop to capture, Wesley wastes no time and attacks him. For a blitz, this is an extremely intense game. Bishop back to the seventh, and here Wesley uses e4 to get the knight to jump here. So what is happening here is the knight on e4 is after this guy on d6. It's bishop on d7, is not greatly positioned, but at least he's alive. What you might also worry about is something like g5. And if g5 is unsafe or risky, Wesley can push on with this guy on the rim. When Kasparov saw this potential problem coming, he repositions the bishop here. There came this bishop into the diagonal too. Gary's in fact bombarded on many fronts. One thing you can't allow is to drop this gun these eggs. If the pawn falls, Wesley will eat Kasparov alive. 
With Kasparov getting his queen into cover, Wesley launches this queen move. That's a tricky one. Can you see why? Maybe it's difficult to see what the queen is doing on c2. But pay attention to this queen move. It's a blitz, and in many fast games like this, we will also have quite a number of moves that may not look ideal. Kasparov may have played for fun, but when he joined in, he had nothing to lose, in fact. He's no longer a professional, and with little practice, he knew he was in for some major challenge. Not just in this game, but in the entire Ultimate Blitz Challenge. Positionally, Wesley appears to be stronger. Gary has very few moves, and he knows it. His rook, or both rooks, are tied up. The knights, well, actually both of them, are used as defenders. Same goes for the queen too. And this is definitely a problem. What Kasparov did here was to go for a king move. He's basically out of moves. He appears to be a sitting duck. Depending on how Wesley gets on, Kasparov might be yo-yoing with his king. Queen b2. There goes the king again to g8. And now queen a3. And Wesley was all the time after this gone d6. And now he's extremely close getting to him. Gary has been shaking his head for the last five moves. And he's in a pickle. He came up with this thrust. And Wesley finally goes for it. The pawn was eliminated. The knight was removed. They came this trade. Takes and takes with the queen. And we find the queen's disappearing too. Wesley's now in the driving seat. And has a dream position. With the board beginning to clear up, there are... A few things happening. The bishop on d7 is now hanging. If you got rook d8 to cover, there is a problem. For starters, this guy can be removed with a check. And if you now attack the rook, there is nothing stopping Wesley from getting rid of this pawn too. If rook j8 to get the rooks to come off, grab hold of this guy too, and Gary would have bought the farm. If you apply this pin, get rid of the rook, and the capturing with a king is most likely to lead to this. Whether you tried the rooks or not, someone goes south, and it will not be Wesley. Coming back to this position, Kasparov was looking at something else. He left the bishop in, and went for this approach. If the bishop is eliminated, this knight will also come off. And when the recapture takes place, there is a big problem lying ahead. Once this problem reaches your doorstep, something has to give. Rookie two, both bishops come off, but the story continues. You can remove any one from these two pawns. Any ideas which pawn should come off first? It has to be this one from the queen side. The way is clear. If you go for this guy on the king's side first, Wesley will cover in this way. However, if you arrest this guy on the queen's side, you automatically create a passer. Okay, now that we understand the situation a bit more, let's try and fill in some gaps. When this guy came off, Wesley first captures, and you know, rather than cover for the bishop or move him, out of harm's way, Kasparov tries to instill confusion, and he does. He attacks the knight. So with the knight coming under fire, at the same time the rook is also exposed. Wesley had no choice but to trade, and it was Wesley here who blunders. Let's sound this. Now that this was sound, this is the very reason why you would expect the unexpected when you don't have the time. As your time reduces with every single move, 
you would expect to spot more and more errors. Wesley here got rid of this pawn. If we put this bishop back, if you lift the rook to the seventh, it would actually be job done, however you choose to play it. If north is already south, he will go south. If you remove the bishop, you additionally trigger checkmate in just about a handful moves. Coming with this check, king h8, another check is on its way. And after king g8, this is what you need, and let's hear it. Checkmate. This is one way to end the game, but after the two brothers reach the seventh, no one in the right mind will grab hold of this bishop and get checkmated. Time does many things to you, or shall I say, the lack of time does. If you go for this rook move, you can still deliver this check, king h8, another check, king g8, another check. And when the majesty is forced west, because there is no way this bishop drops from the fourth, maybe now would be the best time to get rid of this guy. This would have been an open and shut case, yet Wesley miraculously misses it. Coming back, obviously no rookie seven, but this pawn is eliminated. The variation now allows Kasparov to take a breather. He came up with something very similar to what we saw earlier. Rookie two, both bishops came off, another pawn disappeared, and Wesley here gets his guy to advance. Rook f3, rook c7, and both would try it. It's whoever runs faster. And you know, this is exactly where Chuck Norris would come in. Did you know Chuck Norris is able to move this pawn one go? But coming back to the serious stuff, what you see here is quite complex. Can anyone get in a promotion first? Because if this happens, it will be game over. Rook c7 is crystal clear. Expect d7 and then a rook check and you will bite the dust. Kasparov gave his position some good thinking and in the end he too advances this guy to the fourth. So what was now wrong with d7? Nothing and yet Wesley attacks the rook. With Kasparov getting the opportunity to retreat the rook to the back rank, Wesley in a way blows it big time. Not sure why in case we forget. If you go for d7, rook d8, maybe you can try something like this. No, doesn't work. Rook d3 would be disastrous. Okay, this variation does not work at all for Wesley. After king g2, rook f8. Wesley here tries this. Rook d8 hunting after the pawn. Wesley lifts his own rook to the sixth to cover, with Kasparov now making a run for it. Has he just allowed Wesley another big, big chance? Wesley first took with a check. Kasparov gets his king to find the edge. And what Wesley does here is unbelievable. And it is what he does. He applied this check. The king is forced west. Wesley repeats a check. King f8, rook h6, king g8, the checks repeat, and the game finally ends in a dead draw like this. Unbelievable. Wesley is up by two full pawns, but one f did he settle for a draw? Was his time that low, which forced him to repeat, not to lose? Did he worry about this passer and whether he was able to stop him? Or was there some other reason? If after king f8, Wesley went for this rook response, even if this guy is eliminated, you can either challenge this rook right away to gain the pawn back, or something stronger has to be this check. King e8, rook h7, and Kasparov is busted. This game 
has been a mystery on many fronts. Kasparov has been in trouble very early on and in a very mysterious way gets out of it. Not once, not twice, but thrice. There are a few things I cannot remember from this game, so I went back to check. I can now confirm that three seconds after the five minutes are given as a delay and do not add up if you play faster. Using this system, you can never increase your time above the five minutes you initially get. Looking at one position in particular, after rook a6, Wesley tries a trick. If rook b6 to trade the rooks, this runs into bishop a5, and this would have been catastrophic. Another something I want to add is that this game we saw today is or was the fourth time they played against each other. Gary Kasparov shocked the entire chess community with his comeback. In the first few games, it was Gary who took the lead in the Ultimate Blitz. But with psychology playing a huge part in what was to follow, if it wasn't due to Kasparov blundering his knights in not one, not two, but three times, he could have ended first. In this game today, Wesley came out of the opening much stronger. And this very line we saw today was repeated in the earlier game. If you roll back to that C5 initiative by Wesley, this one took Gary by a big surprise. It did not appear in this game as earlier as the other game, but it showed up later on anyways. Though this one ended in a draw, just like the other one did, Gary did come up with some extraordinary responses. Even when he's in trouble on basically all fronts, he still came out of it in one piece. If this was the miracle he needed, this is exactly what he got. I mentioned something about the time. Let me be more specific. Chess is so strange in so many different ways. I fully know how and why this game drew. Check out this picture. Wesley was down to his last seven seconds and couldn't see the finish line. Basically, it was Gary had a problem with his clock. Look at what you see here and compare it to this picture. In this point in time, Wesley is up on material and up on time too. There is a huge time gap here. And normally Wesley should be going like a train. It's 2 minutes 26 versus 1 minute 11. At this point, when Wesley played rook c7, take a good look at both players' this time. It's 2.04 against 1 minute and 9 seconds after b4, king g2, rook f8. Rookie 2, Kasparov burned 26 seconds to play Rook D8. It's a huge time to go for anything that requires 26 seconds. How do we know this? It's here. Another 26 seconds have just disappeared from Gary's clock, and this includes a 3 second for the delay. Two moves later, Wesley used, well, <laughs> 40 seconds for one move, and here Wesley runs down all his time to the very last seven seconds. He couldn't find a way to end it. And it was Wesley now reaching a critical time level himself. So basically, Wesley was captured in this dilemma. 
and in the end was very happy with the draw. 40 seconds for a single move in the end, followed by another 49 seconds, and in the end, it was Wesley who ended up in time trouble. Unbelievable. In the meantime, if you check out Gary's time, he in fact used Wesley's time to prepare his follow-up responses. After his rock move to the eyes, Gary had not lost a single second, and this is how the game ended. There is plenty of more to come from this event, but I will bring it up next time when we deal with probably another Gary Wesley game. Very powerful, but very strange game indeed. Wesley spent nearly half of his entire time trying to figure out how to end things and never got there in the end. It was in this very event where Wesley produces Immortal and this victory has been in fact against Gary. It was their round two game. And in case you need a refresher, check out this link, which should appear in 2-1 just about now. Check out Heather Rosolimo of the Sicilian Rosolimo. But in the modern defense can wipe out anyone in just about 25 moves. More to come for sure. So you know the drill. Your chess puzzle are here. And whatever you do, guys, safety always first. <laughs>